the Joan Quinn Profiles. As an editor for Andy Warhol's interview with the Los Angeles Herald Examiner, LA Style, and Detour Magazines, Joan covered the social set, the Hollywood hotshots, the international art scene, the mysteries of food, the excitement of travel, and the fabulous world of fashion. Joan continues to find creative people on the cutting edge who make things happen. Here's Joan Agajanian Quinn. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome to the Joan Quinn Profiles. Waiting to be profiled are artist Richard Duardo and Dan O'Connor, who is the artistic director of the Impro Theater, and uh, you'll hear all about how to improv things. Right now, we're going to improv with artist, printmaker, director of modern multiples, Richard Duardo who was born and raised in Boyle Heights. He went to Franklin High School, and he was in UCLA's art department. Our friendship goes back to the 80s, which I hate to say, with Warhol and all of the graffiti artists. How were you associated, and how did you get to meet those people like Keith Haring and Jean-Michel Basquiat and Futura and Fab, 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 Fab Freddy, Freddy and Kenny Sharp. And Richard Hamilton, remember him? Yes, yeah. I do, and on and on. Yeah. But you, you were born and raised here on the east side of town. Yeah, I, well, you know, <laughs> so I started to make enough money to travel, you know, the touchstone for every wannabe artist is you've got to go to New York, right? And is that what you were thinking? Because you were making prints at that time. Yeah, I think we started with John Van Hammersfeld, mostly graphic designers, Mick Haggerty. Fantastic people that we knew here, too. Yeah, and John, I know, approached me. <coughs> I think the thing that brought me to the attention to the art world at large is when uh, we did the MOCA poster when MOCA was just a concept, oh. a promotional piece for the MOCA, I don't know what they were they were. Your, your graphic studio did it? Yeah, we did uh, 500 prints to propagate this whole notion that it's time for a contemporary museum since uh -huh. the Norton Simon had closed uh -huh. and was the, the go-to museum that was showcasing, you know, what's going on in contemporary art. I remember seeing the Marcel Duchamp show there that... Oh, right, in Pasadena. Helped, yeah, right. when I was a kid, and it just turned my head inside out. Anyway, John Ben Hammer said, Van Hammersfeld was part of the advisory committee. And I know there was about 150 artists involved, and I was already downtown. So I said, John said, we need to push this concept. So I said, well, we'll do a promotional print for you guys. I think we did 500, and they just went out. And who, d who designed them? Did those guys? John did. John designed them, yeah. and you printed them. But you wanted well, to Well, I guess I published them because I paid for them. Published them. Oh, yeah. excuse me. Is yeah. that the well, difference? Print, Let's talk about that. Well, the printer, if you're, if you're just a <laughs> contracted printer, somebody gives you the money and yeah. you reproduce or you... Oh, then you're the publisher? And when you pay out of your own pocket, you are the publisher. You're the publisher. So I was the publisher and the printer, okay. physically. Okay. I got a physically printer. Okay. So you made enough money in your print shop. Early and you went career. back east. Right. And how did you get these introductions to these people? Uh, geez, you know, I'd have Did we to know each other before you went back? Or did I meet you? No, I didn't meet you till probably around 83, 84, in, the, in, the in that little yeah. window of all that club stuff going on, and Robert the, Downey Jr. getting crazy drunk at... And Matt Dykes, at, uh, at, Flaming Colossus. Oh, yeah, Alice. Michelle Ami right. and the twins, the French twins, Nicholas. Right. And, yeah, I was basically... Power tools. Power Tools. That was this, that was another club. And Cafe des Artistes. Right. Okay. So that's where we. Yeah. But you already knew. Pretty much like, everybody. The graffiti artists, and you knew the scene here. No, I started in the L.A. punk scene doing flyers and posters like Richard uh, Raymond Pettibone was doing. Oh, oh, oh! But I mean, you knew the guys in the East. Oh well, not till maybe well. Yeah, actually, the 80s. Well, I met my first trip out was. I graduated out of UCLA in 1976, and I went immediately to New York. Oh, you went right away. Okay. And then I met some people, but I guess you could say, I mean, great people, but you would, there's not a name I could drop. But about two years later, after <laughs> I started my, my print studio, uh, I had done enough work, and I started apprenticing 
for Jeff Wasserman, who was a Gemini master printer, who oh. where that's when I started to meet in my apprenticeship, Ed Boucher, Ed Moses, oh. Hockney, oh. like a Billy Al Bankston. Oh, I remember got that it. Yes, the early of 80s course. because uh, Jeff Wasserman had left Gemini and opened its own studio in Santa Monica, and mm. I begged to work for free because he was a master. But were you going to be a printer? You were yeah, be that's an what I wanted oh, to be wanted a to master be. printer. I, I, had, see, I, I see. never had any designs or desire to be. I think that I thought at the time after I got out of school, UCLA, I thought this is a suicide path. To I be mean, an artist or to be a printmaker? <laughs> well, you, you know, statistically, I did the research. It's like the whole art world to be a successful artist is predicated on 89% of the rest. <laughs> Dying in the trench. <laughs> I don't think so. Okay, how Can about? Can you imagine 80, how many? How about ninety-six percent? Four percent make it. Four percent make it. Big. Yeah. But other people make a living at it. Okay, that's another ten percent. Okay. How about that? Three but quarters of everybody that charges out of the trench, meaning school with your art school where you were, guaranteed five years later their history. Did any of your? They're working for their parents. Did any <laughs> of your teachers at UCLA? help you? I was, I studied under, believe it or not, uh, and he wound up be becoming a rather successful and still is art dealer. One of my instructors was Peter Gould. He was? His first job in the United States was teaching the history of design at UCLA. I did, I did not know that. That's and, fabulous. Yeah, and that was my introduction to names like David Hockney, Chaz no, 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 De design. Oh, and design. John Ben Hammersfeld, oh, Milton see. Glaser. So oh. I, I was keyed into uh, a design major with a printmaking minor. I okay. wanted to be a graphic designer. Okay, so graphic designer and artist are like, psh, yeah. You, they both think the same way, but they both do different things. Yeah, one one is considered in the commercial realm, and right. the other one is pursuing the uh, right the noble path of of. Fine art, yeah, <laughs> of fine art. But you encompass both of those. Yeah, well, yes. Yeah, because and you I work think, with artists. Yeah, and, and and you're the master graphic person. Because when an artist comes to you, do you tell them how you want to print it or no, what no, you're no, going to no. do? You know, I, from my apprenticeship with Jeff Wasserman, that's why I was wired as a printmaker. Was that uh, I learned from Jeff is your uh, you're just a tool, ah. and you have to defer any notion of incorporating your ideas. You're there to serve an artist that wants to take your skill set and realize an image, and you've got to get your ego out of it. And I bought that, I bought that into that whole program program to the point where I pretty much still operate in that way. Yes, but you say you take your ego out of it, but on the other hand, your ego comes into it as being the master printer. No, the ego, doing it, the craft. The craft, okay, being the craft of the master printer, yeah. doing it better than anyone else could say an Ed Ruscha print or a Shepard Fairey print. Well, or when, when you're pursuing a craft, you're focused on mastering the process. Okay, so, I'm going to just not even ask you any of these other questions about all the fancy people that you met and that you worked with. You've worked with over 700 artists. Yeah, but I want to talk about all those I, East Village guys. I know, but you have the same feeling going now, even though it's 30 the, or 40 years later. 34 years you later. You know Shepard Ferry, you know Retina, you know Al Mack, you know... Have you ever seen Banksy? Oh, yeah, he was in my studio for what 10 days. What does he look like? He won't tell us, right? I can tell you. He, he wears looks, a hoodie. <laughs> he looks like uh, a skinny version of John Lennon with bad teeth, great personality. And uh, does he let people see him now? Does he tell? I don't know. You know, he we met in 2006 when he had the seminal show in Los Angeles, and he was in town for about six weeks. He was in our studio for about nine days because we had to do six separate different images, uh, basically a portfolio of prints. And it was pretty labor intensive. We had to close. I didn't know who he was. So, so Shepard did the introduction. Shepard knew him. Shepard Ferry knew him. Okay, so when we were talking about the Warhol days, those guys were called graffiti artists. These guys now are called street artists. Is street, that a difference? What is it? 
urban art. Urban I guess art, it's been street artist. Rebranded for to make it more palatable for the collectors at the uh, auction houses. But I, it's urban. Uh, it's <laughs> urban. But I met I I met with you up at the Getty Retina. Right, right, right. And and so you're friendly with this whole new group of people as well as the other. 500 or 700 artists that you've worked with. Yeah, well, I think fine it, artists. It's let's an say. interesting thing that now that there's a perspective of like 35 years, I've seen cycles right. of generational cycles of artists come through our studio because they're riding. You might, you, I don't. It's the not wave. a fad, but they're riding a wave that <laughs> right. happens to be, you know, in favor. Okay, let's talk about your studio. It's called Modern Multiples, Multiples right? But it started like it had three or four different. It's been mutating. Yeah. yeah. Well, when it started, it was called Echo en Aslan. I remember that. Multiples, which was because I was just out of UCLA. I was still very political. I was still very angry about occupied territory. I'm a Mexican American <laughs> Chicano, so I wanted the imprint on the print that came out in my studio to reference that it was made in. Occupied territory. H.O. H.O. Made in, you know, the Southwest, which right. is what the Aztecs considered Aslan. where Aslan would be. After a couple of years, my sister said, are you done with this? Because <laughs> people are it. having a t hard time <laughs> writing the check out for our services. <laughs> so I said, what are you suggesting? She said, let's cut it down to Aslan multiples. I said, I'll give you that. Oh, that was and it. And then okay. two years later, she said, Richard, I know. What? Let's call it multiples. Oh, she she's the one she who's been pushing. the motivating. She so, was my studio manager for So about then seven. it's modern multiples. Well, <laughs> in about 1995, I said, we've got to retweak ourselves. <laughs> so we added modern multiples. Okay, to. so so how do you make this into a business? Uh, well, by charging people for what I do. <laughs> <laughs> really, I don't do it for free. Although no, I would we say know. you did do a lot of charitable work. Oh yeah, you've worked for museums and people who artists who and, couldn't and afford artists, to come. I, I, I'd say what we've been doing for the last thirty-five years, probably thirty to forty percent of our production, I underwrite Is that or right? I publish. And about oh, well, the if you publish, it's good. If yeah. you'd published all of these 700 artists... I'd be broke. Or I, oh, you'd be I broke or you'd be a millionaire. Uh, yeah. Well, I could have been a millionaire a couple, couple times over already. Wait, but so I what's am, the difference? Well, uh, the people that I publish, which is consumes about half of what our you know, mm -hmm. annual budget is, uh, which I'm talking about maybe about $180,000, $200,000 a year, of the money I invest in those artists, I would say 60% of them, we can't sell their work. We can't find an audience. Is that right? Well, because That's we, a big percentage. Well, because I take a big risk. I don't go after brand names. I go, I, I've anchored myself way from the beginning. I wanted to, I always thought, you know, that between Gemini, Cirrus, mm. uh, Crown Point Press, they had locked down all the blue chip artists, brand names. So you and it was all about them. making money. And I thought, all these generations that are coming out, they're being ignored. I have a print studio. I'm not a dealer. And they've got ideas that, why, you know, I always thought, why isn't Gemini printing or Jean Milan? Well, you know, I don't know what major studios were here in L.A. I only can think of those two. Yeah, no, that's right. I thought, uh, although Fred Hoffman started that, but, but none of them have gone. None of them have stayed. Oh, Gemini and... Gemini is now... Stayed, the, like you've stayed. Well, I would say now, I'm very proud to say, I never imagined this 30 years ago, but I am the third oldest print studio in Los Angeles. That's what I mean. So you've stayed. You have staying power. And my, my position in that whole realm of printmaking studios is I've always gone after young emerging artists as a publisher. And that's what we did today. You're working in my world. Yeah. I wanted you to shine, yeah. and it's all over. Yeah. Thank you very much. My pleasure. <laughs> Don't go away. We'll be right back with Dan O'Connor. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome back to the Joan Quinn Profiles. I'm here with actor, writer, director, professor, Dan O'Connor, a third-generation San Franciscan 
who's the founder and artistic director of Impro Theater. He started at age eight, acting at the American Conservatory Theater, where he continued his training and at 18 auditioned for entry to the Weber Douglas Academy of Dramatic Arts in London. He's done so much more uh, <laughs> than we can even say, yeah. but, but you did study with Keith Johnstone as well. Yes. And so tell us who that is. Well, Keith Johnstone was a, uh, was a member of the Royal Court Theater in the 60s uh, in London. I see. And he was charged with uh, working with writers, young writers and young actors. And uh, one of uh, his mentors was George Devine, who's a legend in, in British theater. And uh, they went to a wrestling match one night and wondered why theatrical audiences don't get excited as <laughs> wrestling audiences. Is that right? Yeah. And that's where uh, it's the seed of, of uh, theater sports, which is what Keith Johnstone is best known for. Uh, uh, he later moved to, to Calgary, Alberta, Canada, and was a, a drama teacher, a professor at the University of Calgary for years, and um, theater sports was uh, initially a, a way of getting actors to be more visceral in scenes and to be, uh, and to cr help them create stories. And theater sports? Yes. That's what you said. So you, you said that he had this method of teaching, and you taught yourself at University of Texas, UCLA, Duke, Pepperdine. Did you follow, when you were teaching those classes, did you follow what he taught you? Well, the kernel of, of what I uh, learned from him and learned doing theater sports in San Francisco in the, in the late 80s, uh, we, we had to kind of teach ourselves. We, we, had been, we had been taught theater sports, and then the person who taught us went off. And so we came up with all of these new and different ways to do narrative-based improv. So it, when, I, when I've taught at these different places, like the MBA program in Texas, we're using improv games to teach business people how to communicate. Oh, that's right. It was in the business department. Yes. So you had to get them to be comfortable with audiences, I guess. To get them to be comfortable with audiences. Also, every interaction is a story. And that's something that people forget. But uh, the, somebody who's doing a sales job is basically improvising all the time. And that's what we we talk to these very, very smart people at the University of Texas. I know, but now that you're saying that, sometimes you have these people come up to you and you, you know that it's just so such an act. Uh -huh. And it's not improv like you're saying. It's like rehearsed and you feel like an idiot listening to them. Yes, when, when people are not authentic and when they're not telling the <laughs> truth, it's the same thing in acting. It's the same thing I would tell an actor that I was directing, is if you're not truthful, nobody's going to believe it. It's the same thing whether you're selling widgets or performing Hamlet. Well, since the age of eight, I want to get this in because we've seen your acting and your directing on stages all across. So you know what all across the U.S. Uh, uh, we know what you understand about acting and how to make it authentic. And is that why improv is so dear to your heart? It is. I mean, I've had a very pretty good career <laughs> and, and uh, in large part because of improv. Uh -huh. I mean, uh, when you audition for uh, a lot of uh, features today or a lot of commercials, you have to improvise. You have to be able to uh, think on your feet and sell the product or sell the script, whatever it is. And so improv more and more, uh, I think, is essential for actors. And it's only in the last 10 years that drama schools have really started to teach improv. Oh, is that and, right? Yeah, and when I first came to L.A., uh, most drama schools did not teach improv. They didn't think it was necessary. And the thing is, if you want to be a successful commercial actor today, you have to be able to improvise. Well, why did you start a company if they're teaching it in drama school? Most of us were either uh, classically trained actors or had been to uh -huh. drama school, and we wanted to use all of those skills we learned doing Shakespeare and classical theater and our improv. And so what we came up with was Impro Theater, which is improvising full-length plays in the style of Chekhov and Shakespeare and Jane Austen. That's what's so fantastic. So if it's in the style, and it's improv, I'm going to just jump right into this, sure. and you direct it, uh -huh. um, how can it be improv if, um, if I'm directing they don't have it? a skip, a script? Well, it's, it's <laughs> completely improvised. We will say with Jane Austen, 
we read and watched as much Jane Austen as we could for three months. And oh, then, so it's just one group is doing, oh, yeah, just your troupe. Just my troupe. I got it. I and see. so we're a theater company, but we don't have a script. So you read everything about the about classics. the About the author, if we're doing, like we're doing Chekhov and Twilight Zone in the fall at the Odyssey. At the Odyssey, right. And we read and watch as much Twilight Zone and as much about Rod Serling and as much about Chekhov. And then we're doing them in rep. We're not doing them on the same night. But we get a suggestion from the audience and then do a completely brand new Chekhov play or completely brand new episodes of Twilight Zone. No, you get a suggestion from the audience? Yes. Then the audience doesn't have to know Chekhov. No, they don't have to know Chekhov. Or they, they don't, don't have, have to know Jane Austen. No, or... no. In fact, my greatest oh. victory is girls bringing their boyfriends to see Jane Austen and the guys having just as good of a time even though they know nothing about Jane Austen. So. Well, do you stay true to Jane Austen? Oh, yeah. Do We're in full, full costume for both for all of our shows. The, there's a set. Uh, there's sound design. Uh, there's improvisers in the booth because we don't know when the scene's over, so we have to sort of have a, an improviser in the booth who's able to bring down the lights when that scene is over. Okay, so you're directing. Yes. But they, they have no idea what they're going to be doing. So how are you directing them? Well, most of my directing comes in the three months leading up to oh, the opening the show. That's it's about <laughs> making them familiar with maybe stuff about uh, Chekhov or Rod Serling that they otherwise wouldn't have known about, uh, and making sure that people are playing inside that world. Because we're not doing parody. It's not, it's not uh, if we were doing, like we do Tennessee Williams as well, and uh, most people when they improvise Tennessee Williams talk about mendacity, the heat, and, right. look, and call somebody <laughs> sister woman. And that's about <laughs> it. But we're trying to dig deeper and do something that Tennessee Williams might have written. Uh, so it's a much more challenging thing. So you, you during the play, uh -huh. are you there on stage, backstage? Uh, I'm, I'm a performer as well, so oh, I'm, I'm in the show, and I try not to direct during the show. Well, that's what I mean, but yeah. don't they look to you to direct? No, they're all yeah. very, very talented professionals um, who, uh, early on, I think probably I, I, I made the mistake of saying, you should go in and do this. But we figured that out pretty quick that that doesn't work because everybody's got their own idea of what's going uh, on. Uh, and so once the play starts, everybody is the director. So during that three months, you're reading, you're talking, you're interchanging. Mm -hmm. You know, like I would know maybe what you would come up with well, we, in your mind. We're developing the same language. Yeah, I see. So uh, hopefully after three months, you and I are on the same page enough to know that uh, if this particular thing happened, then probably this might happen. But maybe not. But, but, but I've <laughs> got to I've got to be willing to surrender my agenda. If you make a choice, I got to go with you. So the thing with improv is you can't just rote memorize anything. No. No. no not There's no, no plots, no format. The only thing you know is the world of that writer, and then you improvise within that. So every night when the audience comes to the Odyssey to see. Um, Twilight Zone and Chekhov, yeah. Chekhov. Yeah. Uh, they see a different play. Every night. In fact, we have people, we had a gentleman come last year to the Odyssey, and he saw 25 different shows. Kept, kept coming? Yeah. Kept coming. There was a number. And what did he say? Did he, did, did he like one better he, than the other one, or what Well, happened? he probably had favorites. I didn't <laughs> ask him, but he, he said, we have a couple of regulars, actually, who will come to 10 and 12 shows during the course of a run because, and this is my favorite line, it's much better than staying at home. Every <laughs> night they get to see they get to see a completely different play. It's, the shows are not uh, horribly expensive or anything, and it's completely different. And there's 14 of us plus five guest actors, so on a given night you might see me oh. and six other actors, and then the next night you might see a different combination. But do you bring someone in from outside? Uh, true? Occasionally, but they have to do the same thing with they the three have, months. They have to go through the three months. Yeah. One of the, one of the things w when you were talking about teaching, I was going to ask you, you've taught the Cirque du Soleil. Uh -huh. What would you teach them? I mean, they already are acrobatics. Well, they're, they're acrobatic and they're gymnasts. They're Olympic right. level gymnasts. Right. But most of them don't come from an from a, uh, acting background. And they have to do a lot when they're not, you know, hanging from a from a trapeze, right. they've got to be able to do this. There's improv that's with interaction with the audience at the oh, beginning of the show. Oh, they do too? Yes, they do some uh, audience interaction. 
Uh, a lot of times they have to support when they're not, when their act isn't up, they have to help support. So there's all these intricate moments where they have to have acting ability and they also, because they're signing two-year contracts, they have to make it fresh for themselves every night. And part of what we're able to do is go in and teach them how to improvise within whatever they're doing. Ah, so you, you did, you worked with several different Zumani. Zumanity, uh, Corteo, uh, Saltimbanco, Love. What, um, and those, when, when they have different titles and they do different things, do they, do they have to delve into different kinds of uh, material for their improv? Well, different shows have different amounts of improv in them. Some of the Cirque shows start with, well, as the audience is coming in, there are characters oh, interacting. Right, right, so right. That, that part, which they call the animation, uh -huh. um, there's a lot of audience interaction, so I am go in there to sort of talk about how to interact and build a story very, very quickly with, uh, with, with the audience. Uh, your improv, uh, impro, improv. Impro, yeah. Impro. And that comes from Keith Johnson's first book, which is called Impro. And oh, it is called Impro. His very, Keith Johnson's very first book is called Impro, and that's what the Europeans call improv. They refer to it as Impro. Oh, they do? Yeah. Okay, Impro um, at the Broad stage, at yeah. various stages around the city. What does someone in the audience, do you, who comes out and says, okay, give us some words? What we, do you do? The whole cast comes out in full uh, wardrobe at the top of the show and asks, like for the checkoff, we've been asking, uh, what's the view out of the window of this house where the play is taking place? And we've gotten everything from Oh, a, you ask the audience. We ask the audience. What do you see when you look out of the window? Right, and they'll say, we've had a burnt pasture. We had a frozen lake. We've had all sorts of things. Uh, with Tennessee Williams, we've asked, uh -huh. what's a real family heirloom? Uh, and the one we got when we were doing Tennessee Williams at the Odyssey last year, which was terrific, was somebody said that their mother had a, a bunch of porcelain heads. Oh, yeah. Uh, I remember wig heads, the, yeah. Oh, wig heads. Or like a porcelain head. Yeah, uh, because yeah. sometimes they were on powder boxes. Okay. Those little porcelain, yeah. Yeah, so she had a whole collection. <laughs> so we did a whole play based on six porcelain heads. Is that right? Yeah. So every night it's different because we, we have no idea what the audience is going to give us. Well, I think every time I interview you, it's going to be different, too. <laughs> 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 so thank you for being with oh, us. Oh, thanks and then for having me. you can come back and do sure. a whole different info. Sure, I'll be a completely us. different person. <laughs> thanks for watching. Keep writing to J-A-Q-U-I-N-N-1 at AOL.com. Uh, and we'll see you next time on the Joan Quinn Profiles.